Hello and welcome to Brand Pivot. My name is Matt Davies. It's my honor to facilitate this for you today. I'm a brand and culture um, consultant and I work with leadership teams all over the world to help them create meaningful brands and businesses. Um, and basically where this has come from is that um, I've been working with some of my clients on helping them pivot and stay relevant to their audience in these difficult times. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is offer this as a free training, as hopefully some inspiration, some ideas to help you in your current situation and, uh, and hopefully give you a structure and a purpose so that your team can really create something um, useful and relevant to your audience in these difficult times. So I hope you find it useful. Um, I hope you find it helpful. Feel free to reach out to me um, uh, if you've got any questions. I'd love to help. What we're seeing and um, where I think we're now in about the fourth week of, uh, of lockdown, at least here in the UK, is that a lot of businesses have kind of steadied the ship. They've put in the correct uh, safety. They've put in the correct um, procedures to kind of keep things going from a business continuity perspective as best they can. Some businesses have had to furlough staff. Um, and I know in other parts of the world, um, and even in the UK, some people have had to let staff go, which is incredibly painful. But what this uh, course is about is really about charting a new course. It's designed for leadership teams who have identified the fact that they need to change, they need to reinvent themselves, they need to pivot somewhat. How far and how much you need to pivot is obviously a question for you in your individual circumstance. But I hope some of the ideas that we share and the structure we're going to share with you, I hope that it will enable you to, to basically come up with a glorious idea, a fantastic idea that will help kind of propel you into the future. So that's the purpose of what we're looking at. Let me just uh, give you a little introduction. What we're going to be using here is some of the principles of design thinking. Now, I'm an old graphic designer, don't do much graphic design nowadays, but but that's my background. And I think as a designer, you're wired a certain way. You are wired to imagine a better future, a more beautiful future. And not only that, you can apply your design thinking to figure out a way to get to that future. You might not, you might not know all the intricate kind of details, but you can design a structure, a process, a format. And of course, that becomes incredibly helpful for businesses as they're trying to navigate these times, trying to align and unite their whole, uh, you know, multidiscipline teams from all over the place to kind of come together behind that great idea. Design thinking basically helps businesses solve problems fast in an agile and a nimble way. Um, it helps them to see a new future and to figure out how to get there. Um, and it can be a little bit messy. It's kind of creative. It's, um, it's, it's about learning fast, failing fast, but failing cheaply, but also succeeding fast and to learn what works and to keep doing those things so that, so that ultimately you come up with something really, really fantastic that is very customer centric and useful to, to, to your audience. So the storm is blowing. The storm, the corona storm is blowing, but let's not let it sink us. Let's do something positive. This course is all about trying to do something positive in the face of the challenges that we have. Now, we want to start off with a quote from a famous management consultant um, called Peter Drucker. I'm sure you've probably heard of him. Um, Peter Drucker is the kind of the, 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 the founder of a lot of um, current management theory. And... Um, he has some interesting things to say about innovation and entrepreneurial uh, behavior, particularly in business. And this is what he says. He says, people work within a structure. For the existing business to be capable of innovation, it has to create a structure that allows people to be entrepreneurial. It has to devise relationships that center on entrepreneurship. It has to make sure its, its, its incentives, its compensation, personal decisions and policies all reward the right entrepreneurial behavior and do not penalize it. Now, what he's talking about here is structure. He's saying that you've got to kind of create something. You've got to create a space in your business where it's safe to come up with new ideas, where it's expected, where it's rewarded to come up with new ideas. So my first kind of point to you is, is well, what's the correct structure? Who do you want on uh, to, to go through this course? What team 
do you need to put together in order for this to be a success? Um, and uh, and so what Peter Drucker is saying is, is we've got to create that. We've got to create that space. And if this is the case normally within normal business practices, I would suggest to you that it's even more important to create this space um, in a in a kind of an environment that we're facing now with the the Corona challenge. So. Let's, uh, let's go through two key points that Peter Drucker makes around this entrepreneurial structure. He says, point number one, he says, this means first that the entrepreneurial, the new, has to be organised separately from the old and existing. Whenever we have tried to make an existing unit the carrier of the entrepreneurial project, we have failed. One reason is that the existing business always requires time and effort on the part of the people responsible for it and deserves the priority they give it. The new always looks so puny, so unpromising next to the reality of the massive ongoing business. The existing business, after all, has to nourish the struggling innovation, but the crisis in today's business has to be attended to as well. The people responsible for an existing business will therefore always be tempted to postpone action on anything new, entrepreneurial or innovative until it is too late. No matter what has been tried, and we have now been trying every conceivable mechanism for 30 or 40 years, existing units have been found to be capable mainly of extending, modifying and adapting what already is in existence. The new belongs elsewhere. So what Peter Drucker is saying here is that your existing business has its demands and so it would be unreasonable and it actually never works in his experience to kind of expect your current team in its current structure to also be working on a pivot as well as dealing with the crisis of today's business management, the current way the business is working. He says the new belongs elsewhere. And that comes on to then his second point. Because in his second point, he says this. He says, this means also that there has to be a special locus for the new venture within the organisation. And it has to be pretty high up. Even though the new project, by virtue of its current size revenues markets, does not rank with existing products, somebody in top management must have the specific assignment to work on tomorrow as an entrepreneur and innovator. So what we're saying in a bit of a long-winded way there is that you need to empower somebody at quite a high level to, to, to take responsibility for this. And it needs to be somebody who is not running the day-to-day -day crisis management of the day-to-day of the -day business. And I would suggest that's the case. You, I call it the SWAT team. You need to get together a multidisciplined team of all parts of the organisation that is undistracted by the day-to-day -day workings of things. So, you know, it's helpful, for example, if your organisation is big enough to have somebody from finance on the team, somebody in marketing, somebody in sales, somebody in operations, you know, uh, and, and somebody quite high up from a, from a leadership perspective to head up the SWAT innovation team to go through the exercises I'm about to kind of outline to you. Now, how does this course work? Well, first of all, um, you need to assemble that SWAT team, right? That super team. And you need to kind of make sure that they're a mixed multidiscipline group, um, make sure that they're empowered to make decisions and that, that it's safe for them to do so. Um, and set some time aside for them to focus. So this particular course is quite flexible, um, but you might do it in a week, you might do it in two or three days, um, or I guess if you were really, really keen, you could probably run through the exercises in a day. Um, so take your time, it's up to you obviously, but you need to make sure you've set that time aside so they're not distracted by anything in order to do this great and important work. The next step is that you need to sit down and watch this video through and what will happen is you'll unfortunately have me present a few ideas uh, and introduce an exercise um, and, uh, and what we're going to call a sprint and then you need to kind of pause the video to allow the team to go and do that. Sometimes uh, depending on how big or small the challenge you feel it is you might want to, to, to let them do it over a couple of hours 
or you might want to let them do that over a, over a week, for example. You could extend this course into a number of weeks. So it's super flexible, but it's a structure, it's a framework that will allow you to do that. So you watch the videos, get them to take notes, and then they've got to go and complete that sprint, go off and, and, uh, and do it, and then come back together at a set point in time to review progress. And then, of course, you want to deploy any results and repeat. So it's a completely online course. Now, my suggestion is, is that you set these times up in people's calendars. And uh, I know, for example, in software such as Zoom, you can share video. So you could share this very video with your team, li uh, listen to it, watch it together, pause it, and then set that deadline to all get back together again. There's a few principles that I want to just quickly outline before you get cracking. The first is that, that we're using um, a swarming principle here. Not everybody is comfortable with it because it's not, it's not kind of waterfall, which is what we're used to. We're used to kind of going along and then dropping a project into another process and then dropping it into another, another process. What this design thinking kind of uh, does is it puts everybody in the mix all at the same time. And so it's creative. It's supposed to be like that. So please don't uh, be disheartened. Um, and know that that is, that is part of it. It allows us to move quick and it allows us to sense check um, different ideas very quickly with the, the multidiscipline skills in the room. The second thing to think about is this is all about innovation, right? So this is about new ideas and coming, and this is a system you can continually run even if Corona wasn't a thing, you can continually run this in your business uh, on an ongoing kind of basis to allow you to continually come up with new ideas, new improvements, new ways of doing things that are better for the customer. The third thing is that this really only works if you set deadlines and hold people accountable. And there's a lot of psychology about um, setting a deadline because actually what we tend to do is procrastinate until we know that we're, we've got that deadline coming and then our brain focuses and deals with the deadline monster that's running around. So what I'd say is, is don't be tempted to, um, to, to, to elongate the sprints. You know, be reasonable depending on the size of your organization and the challenge that you particularly face. But set a deadline and hold people accountable to it. And the final thing is this, and it is that this is all about your customers. It's customer centric. The exercises we're going to go to go, go through are what I call tribe first. We're going to be talking about the tribe a lot. Brands exist to serve a particular audience. And so it's important that you have a good frame of reference regarding that, like who are that audience and uh, how, how are you going to serve them in the upcoming months and weeks is what this course will hopefully enable you to come up with ideas to do. Here it is. We're going to go through um, basically five simple steps, five sprints, discovery, problemizing, solutionizing, verifying, and planning. Um, and then after the planning stage, you hopefully will have a fantastic new idea which will drop into a deployment program, which then either maybe this team will do, or most probably, more preferably, you would then offload this to people that will go and do this stuff, go and do it, um, and maybe just keep checking in with that team. So I'm kind of proposing that you you would do these over five sessions um, and uh, and kind of make sure that you've set that that time aside. So let's let's begin. Are you ready? Good. Here we go. Sprint number one. So what we'll do is we're going to introduce some ideas to you now um, to help get you your thinking and then I'll introduce the sprint. So this is the discovery phase. This is all about, okay, how, what is the context? What is going on really? And how can we add value? Um, these are the big questions. Now, Here's um, Abraham Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, which uh, is quite a famous profiling, psychological profiling tool. And basically what, what he says is, look, um, you as, as humans, we, we go up this pyramid, we go up this triangle, but we only go up a rung if the previous rung has actually been fulfilled. So if you look at them here, we've got like um, physiological, which is kind of like life support, it's talking about we're talking about food and some of the basic things necessities of life sleep and so on the next rung is safety so after we've kind of got our food and, and our basic necessities for life we go and look for, for a bit of safety so looking for protection from the elements 
um, security, order, law, that kind of stuff. Once that's in place and we feel safe, we, 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 we desire belongingness. So we look to kind of belong to a wider group. And so we, we, we kind of look to sit inside that, that, that kind of affiliating peer-to-peer -peer group. And then within that group, once we're in the group, we look to get esteem within the group. So we look to stand out. We look to be recognised for something. And then once we've done that, we look to self-actualise. So we look for something quite selfish, something quite um, unique to us, which helps us live into um, who we, 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 you know, we think we could be, something quite, um, quite, quite unique to us. Now, the important thing of mentioning this to you is to ask this question, like, where are we now playing as a brand? Now, I don't know what you did before, but often um, from a communications perspective, a lot of brands would be, would be playing in the top of the pyramid, like helping their people feel, helping their tribe feel more of an identity, um, more self-actualization. But the truth is, is when Corona has hit, what it's done to most of the public is to, is to bring everybody right down to the base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so what I'd say to you is, is this, is that whatever ideas you come up with, just think about it in the light of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It might be worth, instead of thinking like, how will this help our customers live into their identity? It might be better to ask questions such as, how is this gonna help our customers feel safer, for example? And we might not be used to thinking that way because it's, uh, it's, it's unprecedented times, right? Now, the other thing I wanted to mention at this early stage is that my definition of brand, if anyone's done any training or, or worked with me before, you'll know, is that um, I define brand as the meaning that people attach to you and your offer. So it's not just your logo and some fonts that might come into it, but it's very much more abstract than that. And your audience actually owns it, if you think about that definition, because what we're saying here is, is that it exists in their hearts and their minds. And what we do as businesses and organisations is, is that we ping out messages and we speak a certain way, we dress a certain way, we behave and we source materials and we innovate certain products in a certain way. We do things for our customers and we exist on the basis of a set of beliefs which, um, which we often talk about and we, we, we sort of position ourselves in a marketplace to communicate all of these things. And they all come together in our audience's mind and ultimately they create that meaning. And if, um, if we've done our job correctly, if we've managed our meaning across all those many touch points and, uh, and in terms of the things that we've actually produced to give to a client, then what that means is they'll, they'll choose whether to, to consider buying from us or not. Um, and in today's kind of, um, you know, piece of sort of state of mind of, of our audience, we have to be so sensitive with all this stuff, right? You know, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of press about how organizations are communicating in pretty much the same way um, to, to their audiences. So what I'm sort of going to encourage you to do is think about your specific audience, who you exist to serve, and find out precisely um, what they need and help them to be stronger. The, help to strengthen the tribe. It's gonna be tribe first. This is how we're gonna look at this, this problem of how to innovate, how to pivot. So the first sprint is this. For before we can figure out what we're gonna do, we need to understand the tribe. And so this is where we need to discover um, and take stock of the current issues. Where are the tribe at? It's all about them. It's all about the meaning that they will derive from what we're about to do. And it's all about what we can do for them not about how much money we can make or survival, although I know that that's probably on a few people who's watching this mind. So what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna listen. Now this is what I want your super SWAT team to do, the innovation team. I would like you to get hold of a list of your top customers. Um, I'd like you each to take responsibility of reaching out to a certain number of them. Now I'm gonna suggest five each. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is contact them or at least make an approach in order to contact them. But don't contact them like, like a robot, like with an email. Contact, well, just or, or a questionnaire, I mean. Try and speak to them. That's what I'm getting at. Try and speak to them as a human being and uh, try and be really authentic about this. 
Um, and take notes of what they have to say. Really listen and dig into their questions. Try and find a time when you can give them a call, check that they'll be happy with that, give them that call, and then uh, ask them some really searching questions. We want to find out what their pain is. That's really uh, the purpose of this. Now, we could just go in and go, what, what is troubling you at the moment? But I don't think that's probably the best way. You won't get the best response. So before you call in, it's an idea that you might sort of suggest um, some measures that you might want to take. So, um, for example, here's some suggested questions. Like, if we did X, Y, and Z for you, would that be of interest? Would that help you in your current situation? And if they say... Um, Yes, then you could say, okay, great. Well, tell me how that would help you. Tell me a bit more about the problem that you're facing. If they say no, again, that's a win-win. You'd say, um, you'd say, okay, well, well, what sort of things would you be looking to us to, uh, to, to perhaps do that might help you? So what might be something we could do to better help you? Great question. What problem could we solve for you? How are you currently solving this? And so then we figure out what the, almost like what the, what the other things are doing and why they're not ad adequate. What would be unhelpful for us to do right now? These are all really big questions because what they do is they help us to, to hear from the tribe exactly what the issues are. Now take notes and um, as individuals try and cluster them a little bit. Um, sometimes it's great to just kind of put little quote marks around things and kind of cluster them. But then what I'd like you to do is come back together as a group and share them all. But for now, let's go off then. Let's identify um, which customers we're going to each call. And uh, let's go and, uh, and take stock of the, con of, the con uh, of the context. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video there and, uh, and then press play when you've done that. So, welcome back. I hope you uh, found the conversations with the, with the tribe of use. We're now on the second stage, which is problemizing. Um, what this is all about is really trying to um, disseminate the information that you've derived. I'm, I'm imagining you've found a number of problems that your tribe is currently facing. And so what we've got to do is we've got to kind of simplify that, simplify that for ourselves and, uh, and, and basically to help us to, to easily focus uh, our work and our attention. Now, in order to, to kind of really understand a problem, what, I'm, um, what I'd suggest you do in a minute is, I think you're gonna, you're gonna present to each other your main findings. Um, but what I'd like you to do when, when, when presenting these is to really start asking some questions. And, the, and it's a very simple question we're gonna ask ourselves, which is why? There's this chap on the screen, Sakachi Toyoda. He was the founder of what eventually became Toyota and uh, a Japanese industrialist, very famous for this technique called the five whys. And so basically what he would do is ask why five times to reach the root problem. And, um, and then at every stage of, of, uh, of, of kind of looking at this problem, he might look at putting some sort of solutions in place so that it really protected um, the business from suffering from that problem again. So there's a number of things you could do with that tool, but I'm, I'm just showing it to you now so that you can start using it as you look at the problems that you're presenting to each other. Now, what you might find is as you're presenting them, you'll probably find that there's, there's kind of lots of similarities. And um, what I'd suggest is you, you, you do your best to, um, to, to kind of cluster ideas. So try and, as you're going through, try and say, well, that one sounds similar to that one, let's cluster it. And so hopefully you'll have maybe five or six clusters of, of problems. And then we have to go on to uh, look at this, the problem statement. So in each cluster of problems, it's too complicated, loads and loads of different ideas in there. We've got to simplify it. And asking why, like I've mentioned, is gonna help that. But what I'd like you to do is simplify it in such a way that it's framed and clear and spelt out so that all the group understand what it is that the problem is. And my suggested uh, problem statement um, template, if you like, is this one. Members of our tribe who are, and then you can, you can kind of explain or define the customer segment that you, you've kind of looked at. Uh, and a bit of a description about them. Maybe, for, so for example, it could be like, 
Um, members of our tribe who are single mums, or members of our tribe who are parents, or members of our tribe who are elderly, or members of our tribe who are businesses based outside of London, for example, or based globally. So you define it like that. Members of our tribe who are description are experiencing this pain point. Sum up the pain point. And then finally, which means that there's a negative output. They can't do this. They're feeling worried. They don't feel safe. Um, they have concern for their family, whatever it might be. Now, what this does is, as I say, it helps us to focus on the problem. And, this, and, and we're going to then go in in the next sprint to look at solutions. So we're defining the problem. So as I say, this is what I want you to do in this sprint. I want you to group and categorize the various problems you discovered from your research. I want you to ask why together. I want you to define the key problems in problem statement. And then, and this is the tricky thing, I need you all to come together, look at those problem statements and make a call on which one you think is the biggest problem for your tribe and make a call on that one. Uh, still keep the others because you might want to come back around this process and, and, and pick up some of them, but, but my suggestion is choose one. Don't be tempted to take loads on. Here's a few tips. Resist the urge at this early stage to come up with solutions. In fact, I'd suggest you tuck any solutions away in your back pockets um, because you will get a chance to, to look at those in the next sprint. Make sure your problem has, has come from your tribe. This is so important. Make sure you're not thinking, well, I think this is the issue. Just make sure you've got some sort of sound bites and you've heard it from the tribe um, and it's a genuine issue. And, and if you have to, you might have to go back to the tribe and just double check. And that's fine as well. The final point is don't make... Um, the final point is don't make your, your pain point too wide like your definition. Make sure that it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of narrow and clear and, as I say, focused on what the tribe has said. So, for example, if you just said, like, kind of, uh, uh, you know, our uh, members of our tribe are, are suffering the societal effects of coronavirus, which makes them unhappy, that's going to be really kind of difficult. Try and hone in on exactly what the issues actually are. So I'm going to pause the video there and ask you to complete that exercise and I hope um, I hope you find it interesting as you go through that and it's a bit of fun as well. Keep it positive, keep the energy up and uh, and I'll see you back f once you've once you've identified the key problem that you're going to uh, seek to solve in session three. Okay, welcome back to uh, to sprint three, um, solutionizing. I hope you've got your key problem because in this section of the sprint, we're going to try and solve it. Now, before we do that, I just want to go over uh, and just have a look at something that Seth Godin, um, the uh, fantastic author and thought leader, has to say about coming up with ideas in a blog post that he wrote. He said, good ideas come from bad ideas, but only if there are enough of them. And that's the key point to this part of the sprint. I want you to come up with lots of ideas. I want you to come up with bad ideas. I want you to come up with good ideas. No idea, in fact, is a bad idea, really. It can be an extreme idea and a crazy idea, but that's okay because that's why we have this multidisciplined team in the room so that we can all feed in. Finance might have something to say about that. Operations might have something to say about that. But the key thing here is that we are all feeding ideas in uh, and looking uh, at the ideas. Now, there's some... Now, there's some tools I could have introduced here in some depth. I'll just mention it in passing if your team struggles to sometimes align on how it's thinking. There's a great tool by Edward de Bono called the Seven Thinking Hats, which basically helps teams parallel think their way through a problem. Um, I'm going to simplify that for you. What I'd like you to do is um, when you come to looking at ideas, I, I really want you to have two hats on. One is a positive hat and one is a negative hat, right? Let's simplify it. So um, when somebody presents one of their ideas, I want um, a little bit of positive thinking about that. What, what's good about it? What's great about it? How, um, how could you take that further? But then also what's bad about it? And no one should take offense, right? This is about finding the greatest of ideas. So just bear that in mind. Try and parallel think through these ideas and make sure that you, uh, you're all giving a voice to everybody about them. The other thing I was going to say in this section is, is with design thinking particularly, 
Um, it's not going to be good enough to just have an idea and talk it through. What everybody on this team will need to do is to produce a prototype of some shape or form. Now, chances are you'll be doing this virtually, right? So produce a deck that you'll share. Do rough sketches on it, even if you're just drawing uh, in paint or something, right? Just get something that represents your idea down. It might be a process with lots of little sections or boxes that you kind of draw in from part to part, or it might be a, a website sort of wireframe, or it could just be a rough sketch. But the important thing is here is to get those ideas sketched out. And you might not think there's much in that, but there's a huge amount in terms of helping to communicate the idea with others if it's sketched out. Low fidelity though. I don't want it to be, you know, a work of art. Now what you're going to do is, when you've come back together, is everybody's going to present their ideas. If um, you might want to limit it to, say, the top three ideas, depending on how big your group is. But once they're presented, this is how I'd like you to try and score them. I'd like you to score them out of 10 for two things. Number one, the value to the customer. Like, is this actually going to solve the problem that you're going to solve, you're looking to solve? And number two, the ease of, implication, uh, of, of implementation for you. Like, is this going to be a quick win or is this going to be months and months in development before you could actually get this off the ground? In these circumstances, um, it seems to me that we need things to score highly in both. Like they're both high value and easy to implement. And then what we can do is we can keep going around this process and we might actually then implement a few others as well um, as time goes on. But for now, let's, um, let's score them. So mark the idea, out of 10 value for customers, out of 10 ease of implementation, give it a total uh, and see where you end up. So that is, that is the sprint. Define the solution. Set the group off to create solutions to the problem. Create low fidelity prototypes as a group. Score each one and select the top ideas. And so what I'm hoping is you'll have kind of a top five ideas that will come off the back of this. Few tips. No idea is a bad idea. We've mentioned that. We need people to feel safe to articulate their ideas. The number one uh, enemy of creativity is fear. So let's make sure people feel safe. Um, crazy off the wall ideas are okay. They can always be paired back by, by the group when they're reviewing them. Volume of ideas is important, but remember when you come to present, maybe select your top three. Um, and score together and talk through your views on why you think it's a certain score, because that helps you understand um, other people's perspectives and try and tries to get to a good place. Healthy debates can and discussions and feedback can take place. So I'm going to pause the video there, set you off to, to come up with some ideas, and then I look forward to, uh, to, to, to having you again for the fourth sprint after you've kind of settled down and scored your ideas. Hello and welcome to sprint number four. I hope you're enjoying the process so far. I hope you've got some fantastic ideas down now um, and hopefully five um, top, really top scoring ideas that you might want to take into this phase because what this phase is all about is sense checking these concepts with the tribe. Remember, it's all about what they think, not just about what we think, okay? So we've got to add value to them. We've got to be relevant to them. So what we're going to do here is, is we're going to dive straight into the exercise is you're going to check in. So you're going to reach back out to the people that you spoke to, everybody in this team. And you're going to take your top, uh, your top ideas, maybe your top five ideas, and you're going to try and present them to, to, those, to those people. And again, like uh, you might need to refine the, uh, the prototypes the team had done, maybe make them a little bit of a higher fidelity so that they feel a bit um, better. However, don't make them completely polished. Like it's okay, you're just sense checking it with your audience. Um, and explain that to them. Say, look, we're just working on some stuff. We just want your views. We genuinely want to help you. You told us last time that this was a big problem. Here's five ideas that we've come up with that might solve that problem. I want to talk them through and I'd love to get your feedback on what you're thinking about them all. And again, take notes. Take notes to their comments as you go through this. Um, and when you've done that, come back together as a group and revisit the scoring. That you, that you had. Now you've listened to the tribe. Maybe the value that you thought would be uh, placed on these things is more diminished, or in fact, it might even be higher. Um, other ideas might come from the tribe, which you might want to kind of float through the team and modify some of these ideas. Um, and, uh, and so hopefully at the end of that, 
you should have um, a really fantastic, great idea, um, which is a clear, you know, a clear winner at the top of the uh, of the scoring that you can then take forward and actually begin to deploy something which is high value and uh, and relatively easy for you to implement. So, the other thing I was going to say here is from a tip perspective is if 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 no idea seems to resonate well, then that's okay as well, right? Because you've learned quick rather than gone and deploy something and paid and and invested in something, you've learned that it's perhaps not going to be something that the tribe actually cares about. That's okay. It's just simply go back and circle back to stage three and do that sprint again of coming up with new ideas. Now you have that information in mind. So I'm going to pause the video now and let you check in uh, and verify your ideas with the tribe. Hello and welcome to the final sort of sprint, the final stage of the brand pivot process. Sprint five is all about planning. You've got that great idea, you've verified it, you've refined it a little bit more with the tribe and probably as you've come back together as a team, you've polished it off a little bit more. But now it's all about kind of getting it done. So this is a challenge obviously to do via video because I don't know your circumstances, I don't know your business and I'm not entirely sure of all the details that, um, that surround your particular context. Um, so I'm not going to say a huge amount on this other than um, really it's a good idea to, to kind of be nimble and to try and uh, find the minimum viable solution. So you might have a great idea, a massive process or something. Well, how could we split that up? How could we get something really basic, get it out to customers, prove that it's useful, get their feedback and then reiterate on that to make it better and better and better? What would that look like? What would the milestones have to be? Um, who would have to be involved? for us to be able to basically deploy that. What you might decide is that kind of work is not for this innovation SWAT team. That kind of work might need to be, uh, might need another team might need to be assembled in order to do that. But that team does need to check in with the innovation team frequently so that everybody um, is on the same page and to make sure that what has been um, imagined comes to real life. So my suggestion here is that you, you crack on and deploy, you create your roadmap, you make sure that is all happening, you put um, schedules in, maybe weekly huddles to check where you're at, um, and you put big milestones in. So the first milestone is this, and then everybody heads towards it. Um, and you you basically design the way that you're going to deploy this idea into the marketplace. And as I say, make sure you continue to sense check it every step of the way with your audience. So that's it really, that's, uh, that's sprint five, who, what and when. Map out your milestones, work on who needs to be involved, set the responsibilities and deadlines, hold people accountable, you need to get this done. Um, get a plan, set routines and move fast. That's my suggestion to you. So this is all about taking these ideas and this big idea and, getting it, and making it happen. I've mentioned this tip, start with a minimum viable uh, product, keep it, keep testing and learning. And um, here's another little idea that, that, um, that I've seen some of my clients do. Say there's a massive gap in the idea. Uh, maybe it's logistics, let's say, like how do I get this thing out to my tribe? We don't have a logistics arm to our business, for example. Now, where you see a massive gap like that, the, uh, the quickest way of plugging it is to look for a partnership Maybe a local taxi firm, for example, who are not able to do as much business as they'd like, would jump at the chance to work with you in partnership to get this stuff out to your tribe. Who knows what's possible? This is the time to make connections, to build relationships, and to perhaps be a little bit more creative and out of the box in how we go to market with things. Um, so just bear that in mind. If you can't easily find a way of doing something with the team, with the resources that you've got, Open it up, ask other people, do a deal, and uh, and so that you can stay relevant um, in these corona times. So I'm gonna let you you plan that, that plan that deployment process, um, and the comms obviously as well from a marketing and sales perspective and all the other stuff that goes with it, I'll let you get on and plan that, um, and uh, and I'll see you back for a, for a little outro. Whew, so. I hope you found the brand pivot um, 
series of sprints kind of useful. We've gone through a lot, haven't we? I mean, um, you know, we've gone through discovery, problemizing, solutionizing, verifying, and then planning. And uh, hopefully you've now got something off into deployment. And my suggestion to you is, is why would you stop here, right? Why would you not build this into your, your business thinking going forwards? Because you might have sold one challenge, one problem for a consumer. Maybe they've got more. So you can go back around this whole process um, and continue to add, biz, to, to add value, to innovate, to, to continue to, to kind of use design thinking to create a brand which is really, really meaningful and stands out. A brand that's not just a veneer and a lick of paint and a logo and some fonts and some colours, although that's important. But it's, a, but it's a brand that actually truly, authentically is trying to serve a particular tribe and be relevant to them in the, uh, in the, coming, in the coming years. So that's it, really. Nice one. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you found it useful. As I say, I, um, I don't know if it is, um, but, uh, but this, this has definitely been helpful to, to some of my clients. So I'm hopeful it, it's helpful to you. Um, if you enjoyed it, please do leave some comments, uh, follow me on, on the various channels that you can see on the screen. I'm massive on, uh, on LinkedIn, so it'd be great to get some, some more followers on there. Um, and the other thing that you might be interested in is I've got a few other courses um, that basically run very similarly to this, although obviously these ones are paid. So if you found this one interesting, you might like Brandit, which helps leadership teams to kind of come together and align around the core principles of their brand um, or name it. So if you're coming up with a new name for your new endeavor, Name It might be a great course for you to go through. And they all work in exactly the same way as you've experienced here on Brand Pivot. So that's it from me. Thank you so much. Keep safe. And I hope you found this useful. All the best.